headlines across the world crash out with the mounting fury of World War II, the United Nations have been preparing quietly for an even more profound test of their strength. The rebuilding of the war-shattered countries. The planning... November 1943. To Washington come delegates from every corner of the globe to sign an agreement establishing the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, UNRRA. More briefly, UNRWA. Like the United Nations conferences on food and agriculture held earlier in the year at Hot Springs, Virginia, UNRWA is only one of the outward expressions of the determination of the peoples of the United Nations to plan their post-war lives cooperatively and internationally. <laughs> President Roosevelt, after signing the UNRWA agreement to the United States, addresses the delegates. Here in the White House, seated about a table in the historic East Room, are representatives of 44 nations. United Nations and those associated with them. The people of these 44 nations include approximately 80% of the human race. Now united by a common devotion to the cause of civilization and by a common determination to build for the future a world of decency and security and above all, peace. Back of the President's words, back of the whole formation of UNRWA, lies the picture of a Europe devastated by more than four years of war. In Poland, death, desolation, and disease have become the common experience of a whole nation. From the shelled and bombed cities of Italy, Greece, and France, refugees have fled toward some pitiful mirage of safety. Close to 30 million Europeans have been driven from their homes or shipped like livestock from one country to another to serve as slave labor or to satisfy the hateful racial ideas of the enemy. Destruction has sapped the life of a continent. Millions of homes of the common man lie in irreparable ruin. Railways, lifelines of supplies for everyday life, and public utilities, electric power and water supply have been smashed. Harbor and dock facilities have been wrecked by retreating armies and are temporarily useless. Spiritual institutions have not escaped. Their work in many instances cut off. The burning of the books started in 1933. It is still going on. But within the shells of cities left by the receding tide of battle, life still goes on in its eternal patterns of death and birth. Flashes into its fifth year, and the United Nations armies advance toward the heart of Europe, the lives of thousands of Europeans have become the responsibility of the Allied governments. In this hysterical and explosive atmosphere of relief and welcome, our armies set up AMG, Allied Military Government. This is now known as Civil Affairs Administration and was formed to maintain order among the civilian population and to provide them with the basic needs of life. 
BAA's greatest task is to supply food and medical supplies to thousands of men, women, and children who for years have been suffering from malnutrition and ravaging disease. possible, the civil affairs officers cooperate with stable and respected elements of the population for the setting up of the forces of law and order. But the great extent to which fascist corruption and ideas have permeated civil practice make unacceptable in many cases the use of the existing machinery of local government. difficulties is added the collect situation which CAA as a branch of the fighting armies and geared to the military machine finds beyond its scope. That situation is the great mass of human beings living in the no man's land between war and peace and seething with unsatisfied social and physical demands. <laughs> Such human demands that UNRWA will have to meet when the armies have completed their work of liberation. On November 10, 1943, representatives met at Atlantic City to determine UNRWA's main lines of policy and to work together in an international council of administration with the Honorable Herbert Lehman of New York as Director General. He will be confronted with a tragedy of millions upon millions of people, both in Europe and in Asia, uprooted from their homes and separated from their families. In approaching the task which lies ahead, one cardinal principle, it seems to me, above all else, should motivate our actions and govern our policy. That is the principle of helping people to help themselves. We have been called upon twice within the span of a lifetime to devise a peace in which all men can live in freedom from fear and from want. We failed once. We dare not fail again. We dare not fail again. In the tragic days of 1918, the Allied Relief Administration faced the task of rehabilitation after World War I. This body, in which the small and defeated nations had no working part, provided relief for Europe's starving millions on the principle of well-intentioned philanthropy, a philanthropy that failed to recognize the dangers implicit in bread without jobs, in relief without reconstruction. Embittered Europeans remember Allied charity as a symbol of their defeat and humiliation as individuals. It remained only for men like Hitler to exploit that bitterness on a national scale for their political ends. Today, the people of the New World are fighting another, a global war. But this time, they are fighting with an eye to their post-war responsibilities. Having assessed the cost to themselves in money, material, and effort, they support to the full UNRWA's plans to provide basic supplies to Europe during at least two years after the end of hostilities. In the first six months alone, Europe will need five million tons of wheat to be provided mostly from the farms of Canada. Eggs and egg powder from the United States and Canada will supplement the huge requirement of 800,000 tons of meat. Europe is in rags. Clothing will have to be provided to protect health and life itself. Medical supplies and equipment will be of first importance at a time when epidemics and bodily breakdowns will be on the increase. Most of these relief measures will be useless unless European agriculture is restored on a sound working basis. The new world must be ready to supply fertilizers to enrich impoverished and scorched soils, seed for planting, since vital seed reserves have been used for food. And 
to further enable Europe to produce four-fifths of its own food supply, livestock will be required to replenish its depleted herds. And so today, we of the new world, looking up from the job in hand, are discussing and making plans for our post-war future, looking up hopefully from the soberly ordered life that war has demanded of us to a life comfortable and prosperous by comparison. But we realize that the quality of our future lies not alone in fine cities, in beautiful homes and gardens, which we see as our human right. Nor in plastics and light alloys, the streamlined dream of the shining helicopter. And above all, our future does not lie alone in the victory of our armed forces. It lies also in our answer to the destruction and poverty in Europe, which threaten the whole world with hardship and unrest. In UNRWA, we have taken a first step toward bringing these people of Europe a freedom from fear and want upon which our own economic and social freedoms depend. Prosperity, like peace, is indivisible. Their future is ours. has just seen the film In the Wake of the Armies about the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. Now they're going to discuss it. The chairman is John Wigder of the Workers' Educational Association. Well, now, we've seen a pretty good film. Now, if the United Nations can get together during the war to create UNRWA, then surely we can get together during the peace on equally important things. Now, I think the film has shown us one thing, that unless the people of the United Nations hang together, well, I think we're going to hang separately. Mr. Chairman, how does owner get his money? Well, Charlie, each member nation contributes 1% of its national income yearly. That's all right, Mr. Chairman. I want to know how owner affects me, my length, and my job. Why should we give this money and these goods to other countries? There are not going to be enough jobs to go around after the war. And now we're talking of giving away food and things which we shall need ourselves. Yes, we all want to know what's going to happen to our jobs after the war. Where does UNRWA fit into that? If we use our money to help rebuild industries in other countries, aren't we just financing competition against ourselves and eventually cutting our own throats? That is exactly what's not going to happen. We've got to sell a lot of goods after the war, and we must have a strong export trade. Now, how can we expect the people and the industries in these war-torn countries to buy goods from us unless we help them now to get on their feet again? <laughs> I thought one of the lessons that we had learned from this war was that the well-being of each nation is tied up with that of every other nation. People talk about giving things away to people who have suffered in this war. Think how many lives China, for instance, gave fighting the fascists before we ever came in. We're not giving things away, we're helping ourselves. Today we know that peace is indivisible. Prosperity is just as much indivisible. Uh, Brother Chairman, I'm a sailor, and we seamen are greatly interested in UNRWA. Not only will it help uh, the people in the devastated areas, but it'll also help us. But there's one thing we'd like to know. Are these food and supplies going to be used as a political weapon in these liberated areas? Uh, well, Dewar, the answer to that is that the Council of UNRWA at its first session declared that at no time 
shall release and rehabilitation supplies be used as a political weapon, and that no discrimination shall be made in the distribution of relief supplies because of race, creed, or political belief. That's good. Now, you in the audience watching this film, you have heard many important points about UNRWA raised and discussed. Why not continue the discussion on these points and on others?